Hey there, welcome to the Lore to Death podcast, a deep dive into the lore of your favorite games, movies, shows, and more. My name is Brett, and today I don't want to set the world on fire. I just want to talk about Fallout again, because why wouldn't I? After the craze that has been the Fallout TV show, I think that everyone is in that same boat. Right after I started watching the show, I re-downloaded Fallout 4, loaded up some mods, and started another playthrough, only to have my hopes dashed when Bethesda decided to implement their next-gen update and break every single mod that I had installed. So I was forced to put that on hold until modders slap some flex seal on their work and I can roam the wasteland once again. It's been a few weeks since that's happened at this point, and I'm sure that everything is more or less fixed, but I have been busy. So to satiate my thirst for Fallout in the meantime, I decided to write this episode. I'm sure you already know by the title, but today I want to talk about Vault Tech in particular. And in talking about Vault Tech, I just want to put a little forewarning that I will be using lore that was established in the Fallout show, since it's considered canon, as far as I'm aware. And it adds a lot of jingle jangle jingle to the topic. I'm also going to be using supplementary content written by Black Isle Studios before Bethesda obtained the IP. And I can see why both of these things might rub people the wrong way, since some people are Bethesda purists about Fallout. But I think that they are both perfectly valid sources, and there's no reason to leave either of them out. So with that being said, there's going to be some spoilers for the games and the show in this episode. So if you don't want to be spoiled, if you haven't watched the show yet, then here's your chance to leave and watch this after you've watched the show. So without too much more blabbering on, let's just get right into the topic. vault was a pre-war company formerly known as vault Tech Corporation, but I'm going to simply refer to them as vault Tech. vault Tech started out as a defense corporation and was eventually allowed to win a contract from the federal government which allowed them to design and implement a network of bunkers, which they would be most known for, and those were called the vaults. They also made plenty of other things prior to and around the vaults, which you can argue whether or not was a real product or just a game mechanic, but por que no los dos? And things like the Zach's artificial intelligence, but it was the vaults that made them into the capitalist giant that they were before the Great War, making them the largest company in the world valued at an estimated $3 trillion. But how did they get there? And, well, it's not exactly known how they got their start, and ain't that a kick in the head, but we do know that they had their start as early as 2031, about 46 years before the bombs dropped. In 2031, they acquired a local college in Morgantown and rebranded it as Vault Tech University, with some of their top employees having graduated from or ending up teaching there. Fast forward to the 2050s when the travesties of the constant warring disease, and the collapse of the United Nations resulted in worldwide panic. And the U.S. government put Project Safe House into effect in the year 2054. If you want to hear more about what was happening in the U.S. at this time, I did make an episode about pre-war fallout, and there's a lot of information there about the wars, the disease, everything else. But the details of Project Safe House was as simple as the name. Keep civilians safe from the effects of impending doom. This included shelters that would protect people not only from nuclear wars, but floods, famine, pandemics, and even asteroid strikes and extraterrestrial invasions. And yes, you heard that right. Aliens. And we can open that can of worms another time, but I'm going to leave it at that for now, because of course, the main reason for this was the threat of nuclear war. The rest of the protections were just a cherry on top. This is where vault Tech was able to step up and place their bid for protecting the U.S. citizens from the end of the world. They were, for whatever reason, fairly prepared for this specific situation. At their headquarters in Los Angeles, they built a demonstration vault that served as an example of the facilities that they could provide people as a means to survive a nuclear holocaust. It was this example vault that granted them the bid for Project Safe House and secured their spot as the wealthiest company in the United States and probably the world. The success of this win granted them the ability to expand their facilities and they built a new headquarters in Washington, D.C. The details of Project Safe House were largely under lock and key, protected by the new amended Espionage Act, which means that there's plenty that we don't and will never know about the project. What we do know is that the U.S. government commissioned 122 vaults from vault Tech and had a budget of around $400 billion to do it. We also know that vault Tech ended up spending about $640 billion by the end of construction in 2069. So 
vault spent almost 150% of their initial budget. Which leads to an interesting question. How did the U.S. pay for these vaults? We know by this point the U.S. was facing a nationwide plague and quarantines, as well as fighting a full-fledged war and undergoing a severe energy crisis. Needless to say, the U.S. was not the mighty, mighty man that it used to be. And because of this, they weren't able to just pay out of their own coffers, but instead relied on the sale of junk bonds to finance the project. If you don't know what a junk bond is, it's basically a bond that you can buy that has a higher risk of default at best, but offers higher yields to compensate for the increased risk. So basically, you spend a smaller amount on junk bonds than you would other investments and hope that they will eventually turn a profit for you. But chances were they weren't going to return anything, and hopefully you didn't lose too much. It's high risk, and it's unlikely to ever return a profit, but if it ever did, then you would probably be rich beyond your means. And I'm sure at this point the U.S. understood that nuclear Armageddon was on the horizon, and so there was less of a chance that anyone would ever see a return investment on these junk bonds because, well, banks don't run on nuclear holidays. So the government basically sold hope to people to fund Project Safehouse in the hopes that it would be the saving grace for humanity. However, I mentioned before that there were only 122 vaults commissioned, which isn't really a lot. I want to be able to do the maths here, but there are a few issues with getting an accurate number. In looking into the vaults, we know that some vaults had a capacity as low as 100, and other larger vaults could house around 1,000 people with hot bunking. But the target may have been around 500 depending on the vault. On top of being able to guess that information... We only know the population of 13 of the vaults, which doesn't give us a lot to go on. However, based on the number of inhabitants that we know are in each of these 13 vaults, we get roughly 2,490 inhabitants between those 13. Take 122 divided by 13 and multiply it with 2,490, and we get a number around 23,367, and a bunch of decimal places, but people aren't decimal points. So let's assume, generously that the 122 vaults were able to house 25,000 people. I'm rounding up from around 23,000 to 25,000 because some of the vaults that we have information on were sealed prematurely, having less than 100 inhabitants, or even one in some cases, which I feel skews the numbers a little bit. According to the Fallout Bible, pre-war America had around 400 million people living there. Divide 400 million by 25,000, and we get a whopping 0.00625% of people that would have been able to be saved by the vaults, which is pretty sad. That's less than 1%. Of course, you couldn't have expected to save everyone in America, but that number is just really depressing to look at. And of course, this is just rough maths, and this number might not be entirely accurate. This is just based on information that we could find, and that number is probably closer to 0.01% if the vaults were able to house around 500 people each. So that was a whole tangent, but we were talking about budget. So why did Vault Tech spend an extra $140 billion on these vaults than they were commissioned? And that's a great question. If you have ever worked in or around construction, then you would know that nothing ever goes to plan. At least, it's that way from my experience. I think the major issue is the lack of definition in the scope of the project given to vault Tech when they were awarded the job. I'm sure that there were several things along the way that they didn't take into consideration, like the amount of technology that would need to be in these vaults to make sure that they were safe for a nuclear apocalypse. And the fact that each vault would need its own dedicated security detail, small things like this would add up over time. And much like any other corporation, there was a fair share of embezzlement, corruption, and mismanagement to boot. And not to mention taking the extracurricular vault experiments into consideration. Let's be honest, it was probably the embezzlement that took out most of this budget, but I would imagine that mismanagement was probably chief among the reasons why they ended up going over so far. Not like any of this is actually really relevant. I just thought it was an interesting question and I wanted to delve into it, and unfortunately there's not a ton of information that can actually give me an answer, but we do know about embezzlement, we do know about mismanagement, so I think those things are worth mentioning, and I think it really sets the stage for who vault Tech is as a company. But on the journey to creating these vaults, there were several technological wonders that were created, allowing most of the vaults to be built within nine years by 2063. 
And the last of the finished vaults would be completed by 2069, like I mentioned before. AI Brett here to make a quick side note. Real Brett meant that construction of the vaults ended in 2069, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they were all completed as scheduled. There were several vaults that never ended up being finished, and some that were never even started. There was a whole campaign to start vaults in Canada after its annexation but as far as we know there weren't many, if any, actually built in Canada. If they put me in charge, you can bet that I would have finished all of the vaults within 367 days. But we can't expect that kind of efficiency out of humans. Back to your regularly scheduled human. The development of such technology wouldn't have been possible without the help of other corporations partnering up with Vault Tech like Robco Industries, which provided the Personal Information Processors, or Pip-Boys, to the Vault Dwellers. And while this all seems great, and it sounds like they're doing great things for mankind, they were also simultaneously destroying it in the process. There's an incredible moral question when it comes to governing a company that would become the most profitable company in the world, when their product is only something that is useful when the world ends in a blaze, and they are only relevant as long as there is a war going on. The question being, can vault Tech sustain itself as a corporation without becoming morally bankrupt? If the Sino-American War were to end amicably, the U.S. government would cease to have any need for the vaults, and, and so vault Tech had an invested interest in making sure that the war continued. This meant that they took voluntary steps in ensuring that the resource wars that were holding the U.S. back never stopped, and they deliberately acquired and buried projects that could solve these crises like cold fusion, which was essentially unlimited power. So the answer to my question is invariably no. If they wanted to keep expanding and growing as a company, then there's no way they could have done that and maintained a good moral stance. Other technology that was created by or with vault tech that was used in the vaults were large nuclear reactors that would power the vaults almost indefinitely. They also made organ extractors, motion sensors, and even dabbled in virtual reality with the SimTech 5000, which was developed for the sake of getting vault dwellers accustomed to the outside before the vaults were opened. Other technology for the vaults included simu sun lighting, which is pretty self-explanatory, floor suck auto cleaner systems, the Culinator 3000 kitchen systems, Entertainatron rooms, and the surveillance systems that would be installed in each vault, the Ion-U system. And might I say, all of the names for their products were just incredible. <laughs> just amazing. Their most ingenious invention was probably the GEC, or the Garden of Eden Creation Kit, which was a water purification system that allowed the vaults to basically have unlimited clean recycled water. But my personal favorite of their products was the Holy Bible Vault Tech Edition. And yes, this was literally just the Holy Bible with a Vault Tech logo slapped on it. Which is just, you know... An incredible business scheme, if you've ever heard of one. <laughs> no, but seriously, it's terrible, and it just kind of goes to show the lengths that vault Tech would go to to try to sell a product. Everything that they made was generally perceived as reliable and high quality, which is probably the reason they were chosen for Project Safehouse to begin with. However, as time went on and they sought to maximize profits, they tended to outsource their manufacturing and let the lowest bidder take the job, so quality definitely waned over time. But while the quality got worse, it was still good enough to survive the apocalypse for the most part. The division that was responsible for a large portion of their tech projects was called Future Tech, and was responsible for a lot more than what I just mentioned. Some of the projects that they worked on were related to medical facilities, or films that were shown in the vaults, a studio that created games, maps, handled publicity and promotional materials, and so much more. And you might be thinking... Why do they need all of that nonsense if they're just making fallout shelters? And the answer to that is pretty simple in that they needed to be able to market and sell the vaults to people. If people didn't care about the vaults and they weren't incentivized to get into the vaults, they wouldn't get into them regardless if their government was telling them to or not. And so vault -Tec was kind of the king of marketing. They hired Cooper Howard, a veteran of the Sino-American War and a movie star of the time, to be the face of their commercials. Cooper ended up being known as the pitch man for the end of the world, which ended up hurting his career in Hollywood after being ostracized for selling out. Cooper Howard was also responsible for the promotional shoots that gave life to the Vault Boy and Vault Girl, the little cartoon characters that would act as their mascots in printed materials and little rubber hose cartoons. They even had a large exposition at the Museum of Technology, which was meant to promote their shelters and explain their functionality and what went into making them. <laughs> 
They also had an exhibit at Nuka World, a pre-war theme park, and their exhibit was called Among the Stars, which was to showcase their technology that they had been working on for potentially creating colonies in outer space, which we'll touch on in a minute. And to top it all off, they had all kinds of merchandise made from bobbleheads to lunchboxes and baseball caps to bomber jackets. They really did have it all, and it was all necessary to make sure that everyone knew the name vault Tech and that everyone bought into the idea of living in a vault. By the 2070s, the same decade that the bombs would drop, vault Tech had deemed the U.S. as a failed nation. From Bud Askins, Senior Junior Vice President of vault Tech, we understand that they had no interest in keeping America alive because of this notion. And so they opted to place their hopes in vault Tech and to keep the company alive instead. So this goes back to the morally bankrupt question, and kind of goes against the entire point of Project Safe House, which was a means to ensure that the people and the history of the United States remained intact in the event of a nuclear holocaust. But I guess when capitalism is your overlord, anything goes. And so vault decided that the best way to preserve themselves was to team up with different corporations, to turn the vaults into a series of test environments and basically have them serve as social experiments on a grand scale. And this is where things started to get really weird. Each vault was designed for something different, and each would have a different experiment going on inside of it. Vaults were essentially auctioned off to other corporations so that they could do whatever they wanted with them. There were basically two different kinds of vaults. There was a control vault and what I'm going to call an experimental vault. Each experimental vault was designed for something different. Each would have a different experiment going on inside of it. The control vaults were basically built to exist as they were intended to for Project Safehouse. They were basically there as a buffer so that no one could accuse them of not having the interest of mankind in hand. The experimental vaults were essentially auctioned off to other corporations so that they could do whatever they wanted inside of them. But I believe that the majority of vaults still remained in vault Tech's control. Some vaults were fairly benign, serving as places where experimental technology would be made away from the prying eyes of ethics, or simply serving as a control vault, like I mentioned. Some of these vaults were very purposeful and seemed good, like Vault 22, whose purpose was to study and research genetically modified flora and fauna. And there were some absolutely bizarre vaults, like Vault 77, where they locked away one guy in a vault, alone, with a bunch of puppets for company. And you might be wondering, what is the point of having such social experiments in the vaults when you could just have more vaults like Vault 22 that seemed strictly useful? And the answer would be, data. And the plan was basically to sell off that data with the help of the Enclave. But whoa, 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 whoa. Who is the Enclave? And that's way too much to go over in this episode, that's for sure. In fact, there's probably more history to the Enclave than there is to Vault Tech, but that's also because they survived post-war. So let's go over the Sparknotes version. Pre-war, the Enclave was a deep state paramilitary group. It was essentially a cabal of powerful individuals from across the U.S., which included former presidents, politicians, scientists, industrialists, and pretty well anyone who was insane enough to join their group who had any pull in the country. They were, in their eyes, the cream of the crop of mankind. And to others, they were a bunch of rich bullies who were unwilling to give up their power and were basically a separate entity from the United States. Basically, they were a bunch of conspiracy theorists who loved racism, Darwinism, and plenty of other isms, but that's not really giving them enough credit. It's hard to understand exactly what these people were without going into excruciating detail, but the main point of it is that they were a group of rich, powerful, just terrible people. But what was their goal, and why were they working with Vault Tech to get all this data, and what was its purpose? And initially, it was to gather data and research so they could create a multi generational starship that would be the real savior of society in the events of bombs dropping. Their entire idea was that a thermonuclear war would decimate the planet's surface, which they are correct about, and that the only way for humanity to survive was to abandon the planet and find a fresh start without all of that delicious radiation. But that starship would take only the world's best and brightest, which meant those in the Enclave. So this is a big part of the reason why vault Tech went crazy with their experiments. They had a range of experiments going on from useful to seemingly insane, and all of that data was being funneled to the Enclave so they could take their findings and use it to build their starship. 
Or at least that's what they say. I still don't understand how locking a man alone in a vault with a bunch of puppets could possibly help anyone get into space, but that's what they said. I think the idea was that they wanted to see what people would do in strange situations and basically collect data about people, their actions, their thoughts, and use those findings to create a perfect colony and make sure that nothing could really go wrong. I'm not really 100% sure, and I'm sure that there's a really good explanation for this that I couldn't really find, but do with that information what you will. So with the rich and powerful taking full control over the vaults and using them for experiments rather than safe shelters, vault Tech was basically in full villain mode at this point. Of the 122 vaults, only 17 of them were control vaults, meaning that only 17 were made to properly function as a safe house. The other 105 vaults held experiments like, or as I said before, corporations could do whatever they wanted away from the prying eyes of the government. This meant that there were plenty of instances where people died in these experiments. And not only that, but there were plenty of instances where the vault was designed to kill or harm people so that they could feed that data to the Enclave. A great example of this was in Vault 12 where they were studying the effects of gradual radiation leaks, meaning that the vault doors were designed to not seal properly. And the result is that the vault dwellers all turned into ghouls or died. Did they expect that they would all turn into ghouls? Probably not. They probably expected them to just grow an extra limb and all die young, but the risk was worth the cost to them. They were willing to sacrifice people's lives simply for data. I've talked a bit about a few of these vaults, and I want to go over each of these vaults that we know of and go over the experiments that were planned inside of them. But I'm going to leave that to the end of the episode, so for now, let's focus on vault Tech and what they were up to. Ethics were thrown out the door, and any ethical concern was dismissed as being closed-minded and counterproductive. This extended to their employee handbook, which was, and I can't really find a great way to describe other than this, extremely fascist. If you thought Amazon warehouses were bad, just you wait. The vault Tech employee handbook was so in-depth that it had everything planned out down to bathroom breaks which were a maximum of 135 seconds. Their abusive labor practices were exploitative and unethical, to say the least. Employees were also often subject to medical experiments, which, believe it or not, were not popular among those employees. There were several instances where the workplace and practices within the workplace were attributed to severe depression and even suicide in multiple cases but these were all buried along with all of the other unethical practices that they were involved in. So with all this being said, you might wonder why there were no whistleblowers for vault Tech, and it's honestly really a sad story. Because of the nature of the work that they were doing for Project Safehouse, vault Tech was covered by the government under the new amended Espionage Act, which was an operation specifically meant to silence any leaks about the U.S. military operations, which included the vaults. So with the government at their back, any whistleblowing attempts would have been more harmful for the whistleblower than vault Tech, and would have probably ended up with the whistleblower and everyone they knew dying, or being put into a terrible vault. There were other executives, such as Barb Howard and Bud Askins, who were willing to instigate a nuclear exchange if it meant that vault Tech would be able to get more research data. Since the company had firmly believed that the U.S. had failed, They thought that if they were the ones who dropped bombs on American soil first, starting the exchange that would turn the Earth into a dustbin, they could also wipe the slate clean and redefine mankind. In the spirit of competition, several of the corporations who they had worked with, including Brobco, Big Empty, Ripcon, and West Tech, were all in on this idea. And that's a big part of the reason why the other corporations had any stake in the vaults at all. Like Barb Howard said, we have over 100 vaults spread across America. Enough for each of you to claim several, where you can play out your own ideas for how to create the perfect conditions for humanity. Whatever you want to do, no one needs to know, and may the best idea win. And so all of these companies got together and aimed to play God with the world. And since they were at the top, being the wealthiest corporation in existence, vault Tech could do no wrong, and they did so without repercussions. Like I said, Barb Howard floated the idea to these corporations that they should launch a premature strike to instigate the apocalypse, so as to intentionally design societies that would rise from the ashes of the old world. But it wasn't just done for the fun of it. Ultimately, the goal was to create a society, or several societies, that could learn from the mistakes of the old world and rise up to a new level, where there was no friction, no conflict, and no war. 
To them, the world was too far gone, and in their eyes, a fresh slate was the only thing that they could do for society, and that killing off 90% of the population of Earth was better than trying to stop the wars that were going on and help the people that were already on Earth. Of course, these plans were all internal, and I'm sure that there were numerous NDAs signed by all of their co-conspirators. And despite them literally planning the end of the world, they were voted the company with the brightest future in January of 2077. Around that same time, they were actually facing a bit of decline in sales because there were rumored peace talks to end the Sino-American War. But all of that was dashed pretty quickly with the Battle of Anchorage and the subsequent Anchorage Reclamation, in which the first T-60 power armor units were deployed in Alaska and successfully ended the decade-long Chinese occupation. The Battle of Anchorage caused their stocks to go up again, and people were on either two sides of the event and either believed that the Chinese military was finally backed into a corner and that they were about to be defeated, putting a stop to any nuclear threat, or they believed that this aggression would not stand and it would be the spark for a nuclear exchange. Either way, the war was still going, there were no peace talks that we actually know of, which meant that vault was still profiting. Because of their stock going up, they decided to capitalize on this opportunity by selling off single vault spaces. So as far as I know, communities that were in the vicinity of a vault were supposed to just be able to get access to that vault if there was going to be a nuclear exchange. So if you lived beside a vault, you should be able to just get into that vault. However, Vault Tech decided that they were going to start selling spaces to make them more scarce. So basically, this would instill anxiety in folks about the rising gravity of the situation and raise panic about the end of the world. Because if you didn't have a ticket, you wouldn't get into the vault, which means that you would die. So people would spend their entire life savings trying to get into the vaults. And in doing this, Vault Tech raised their profits, giving them more fuel to recycle this idea and put more into making sure that the country stays in its sorry state and they profit off of people's anxiety. The more money the Vault Tech can squeeze out of Americans, the less they can fight back and put an end to their own suffering. vault was really drumming up the threat that everything could end in an instant, and so they were constantly running drills to prepare people. But this ended up kind of having an adverse effect, whether they intended it to or not. People got bored of pretending that the world was ending, and less and less people showed up for these drills. This also meant that when the time came and the bombs dropped, the vaults were not as populated as they were meant to be because people assumed that the real thing was the boy crying wolf. Some people thought the real alarm was a false alarm, and so most vaults weren't at capacity when they were sealed. This limited the information that they hoped to get out of the vaults because even before the vaults sealed during the test drills, the drop in people showing up made it harder and harder to collect the data they needed to ensure their plans would work after the bombs dropped. So I mentioned the experiments that were going in the vaults before and how vault Tech wanted to create a perfect society that would rise from the ashes of the old world. So I wanted to talk about what vault Tech's solution was and what exactly they wanted to do with their vaults. And what they did was created a series of connected vaults, which were vaults 31, 32, and 33, which were relatively successful in the end to a degree. They technically did what they needed to for the most part, but not as effectively as maybe they hoped. vault wanted to be the ones to repopulate the surface, as did everyone, but they fell short on that because they hadn't anticipated on people creating settlements so soon after the bombs dropped. Whether it's because some of the vaults opened earlier than planned, or because there were just more ghouls on the surface than expected, they were not the first ones up there. And so they basically just stuck to their vaults underground and hid out there until some of them were forced out. But we'll go over Vault 31, 32, and 33 a little bit more when we talk about the vaults. But the same went for pretty much every other company that claimed the vaults. The ones that were supposed to reclaim the Earth after it was wiped clean never really did, and humanity ended up finding a way to make it work without them. So really, none of these corporations, including vault Tech, won in the end, or at least not in the way they wanted to. I would say that Robco came the closest just because of Mr. House, but they kind of all ruined the world for nothing and allowed it to become the raider-infested, irradiated pile of rubble that we see in the games. After the bombs dropped over the next couple hundred years, vault Tech faded into obscurity. The vaults were seen as this boogeyman story to a lot of people because they had just never seen them. And to the people who knew about the vaults, they knew that there was plenty of technology inside of them that they could scrap and sell for caps, assuming that they could get inside, which was exceptionally difficult. 
As for vault dwellers, we saw this in the show that they're seen as these pampered goody two-shoes, people who don't belong in the wasteland. And this is definitely true for some vault dwellers, but as we saw, they're definitely more than capable with the training that was provided to them in the vaults. They're just looked upon like they've never suffered any hardships, which is true in comparison to the people who were born and raised in the wasteland. But inside the vaults, there were plenty of training programs like weapons training, physical training, schooling, everything that would help them to be able to survive in the wasteland because the entire point of the vaults, like I mentioned before, was to nurture a society that would be able to live on the surface. The point was never to stay in the vaults in perpetuity, so it's not like they weren't prepared to go onto the surface. But, like I said, they were definitely pampered in comparison. And honestly, that's pretty well it for vault tech. They were a pre-war capitalist giant with these delusions of grandeur and sense of self that was larger than their pockets. They wanted to rule the world, and they decided that the best way to do that was to basically turn it off and turn it back on again. Only when the system rebooted, they weren't really there for it. They got a little too big for their boots and ended up basically disappearing with the rest of the world. And now that we've talked about vault for a while, I wanted to talk about the vaults. I went over a general layout and the technology within the vaults in my previous episode about pre-war life, so I just wanted to talk about the different vaults, what experiments happened in each vault, and what the outcome was. So, let's just go from the lowest number and work our way up, and I will warn you ahead of time, this is a doozy. There's a lot of vaults out there, and over the years, many of them have been entirely fleshed out, so this isn't going to be a quick in and out like I thought it might be. There is a lot to go over. I considered putting this in its own episode, but I figured that was kind of a disservice, because the information about vault tech isn't a lot. And I figure that while I'm talking about vault tech, I might as well talk about the vaults that they made. Because this really does help understand who vault tech was as a company and how they ran themselves. It's honestly a pretty bleak image, but it does help. And so our journey into the vault starts with Vault 3, which was in Las Vegas, Nevada, and it was a control vault. Like I mentioned before, the control vaults were the only ones made to properly withstand the nukes and were made to be livable past that point. However, while they were control vaults, that doesn't mean that the same thing happened with each of them. They all kind of had a different outcome. So I wanted to talk briefly about what happened to them. So Vault 3 chose to remain in isolation until a water leak forced them to open up their doors and trade for goods and services. And as you'll soon find out, a vault that opens its doors doesn't really stick around for long. Vault 3 was subsequently raided by fiends and the inhabitants were slaughtered. Vault 4 was in Los Angeles, California and was technically an experiment, but was known to the public as per a commercial by Cooper Howard. The vault was inhabited by only scientists who were free to run their experiments with no oversight from any higher-ups. This sounds like it could be something that would be for the good of the people, but then again, people tend to ruin everything. These scientists adopted a policy of letting outsiders into the vaults where they would engage in genetic experiments on the outsiders. This included stuff like turning someone into a cyclops or giving them extra ears. Eventually, the test subjects broke out and took down the scientists reclaiming the vault for themselves. And because the test subjects were all mistreated, they wanted Vault 4 to be a true place of refuge for outsiders and continued to let outsiders in and helped them as needed. Vault 8 was in northwestern Nevada and was also a control vault. This vault's doors opened earlier than the other vaults and in 2091, just 14 years after the Great War, opened its doors and established a settlement around the vault called Vault City. Vault 11 was in the Mojave Desert in Nevada and was a social experiment to see the population's willingness to sacrifice individuals for the interest of general safety. The group had to choose one person every year to sacrifice or else they were told that everyone else in the vault would be killed. The vault dwellers would make a decision by democratic election for the next 16 years until things got really political and didn't end up ending up very well. The vault dwellers separated into blocks who had their own agendas as to who needed to be sacrificed. Each block would coerce other residents to vote in their favor, and they did this by threatening them. Eventually, there was a coup and a subsequent massacre, leaving only five residents alive. The remaining five vault dwellers laid down their arms and went into a sacrificial chamber where they confronted the computer to tell it that they would not be sacrificing anyone this year. They fully expected to die, but to their surprise, a message came up on the screen that unveiled the experiment to the five 
and congratulated them by saying their commitment to human life is a shining example to us all. And as a reward, the vault doors unlocked and they were free to go. However, it seems like the five ended up killing each other as no one was known to have come from the vault. Vault 12 was in Bakersfield, California, and was a vault dedicated to medical experiments studying the effects of gradual radiation exposure. I mentioned this one before, but the door to the vault was intentionally designed with the flaw that it was not properly sealed, thus gradually flooding the vault with radiation. The inhabitants became ghouls over time and ended up founding the city of Necropolis, the city of ghouls. Vault 13 was around the Sequoia National Park in California, and it was a control vault. The inhabitants were content to stay in the vault, not interested in going out to investigate the wasteland until their geck failed. This forced them to send out the Vault Dweller, the protagonist of Fallout 1, to get a replacement. And because of the Vault Dweller's shenanigans, the Enclave was responsible for killing or kidnapping the remaining inhabitants who didn't leave the vault after the Vault Dweller did. Vault 15 was in Southern California and was a social experiment in which the inhabitants largely had different religious, ethnic, and ideological backgrounds. The vault's opening was specifically delayed by several years to see how different people from different backgrounds would interact with each other in isolation. There was inevitable strife, and eventually, when the vault opened 50 years later, the inhabitants split up into several groups. Three of the groups left and formed the three main raider gangs, the Jackals, Cons, and Vipers. One group left and founded Shady Sands, and the rest of them stayed in the vault and tried to salvage what wasn't taken by the ones who left. Vault 17 was somewhere on the West Coast, I'm assuming in California, and there isn't a ton known about this vault. I'm not sure what the experiment was, but the inhabitants were kidnapped by the Unity, a group led by the Master, whom we don't have time to get into in this episode, and everyone was turned into super mutants. Vault 19 was in the Mojave Desert and was dedicated to studying the effects of factionalism, meaning that they were intentionally divided by their values by means of inducing paranoia and mistrust amongst the vault dwellers. The two groups that were formed were called the Red and Blue Sectors. The inhabitants were subjected to subliminal messaging, and there were faked acts of sabotage to reinforce the aforementioned paranoia. This eventually led to several of the inhabitants developing forms of psychosis, and ultimately we don't know what happened to them, but we do know that the vault was eventually inhabited by a gang called the Powder Gangers. Vault 21 is actually sort of hilarious in a terrible way. Situated in Las Vegas, Nevada, it was a social experiment to study excessive gambling. And how did they do this? They made it so that all decisions in the vault were resolved through games of chance. And despite this, it was actually surprisingly stable given the nature of it. And it was great for several years until in 2274, Robert House, the founder of Robco Industries, was able to use this against the inhabitants and visited the vault with a proposition. He ended up gambling away the rights to the vault and won it in the game of blackjack. Now the owner of the vault, he stripped it of its resources and turned it into a hotel. Vault 22 was in the Mojave Desert and was one that I mentioned before that was there to study the creation of genetically modified crops and flora. Eventually, they created a fungus that was able to inhabit the bodies of humans while they were trying to create a form of fungi-based pest control. Eventually, all of the inhabitants turned into spore carriers, unbeknownst to themselves, which eventually killed them through things like forced pneumonia or organ failure. And as if that wasn't bad enough, the fungi managed to find a way to control the dead bodies of the vault dwellers and raised them from the dead as aggressive creatures whose sole purpose was spreading spores and infecting more people. This is really the stuff of nightmares. Vault 29 was on the west coast somewhere, and... We know nothing about it except for a bit from a holotape from one Trisha Miller, who stated that Vault 29 was full of rich, obnoxious teenagers. Vault 31, on the other hand, located in Santa Monica, California, was a social experiment consisting of three interconnected vaults. So Vault 31 was connected to Vault 32 and Vault 33 via tunnels, but they were divided by giant vault doors. Vault 33 was the vault that was Lucy's home in the show, which, just like Vault 32, housed a regular population where there wasn't an obvious experiment going on. Vault 31, however, was much different. It was home to Bud Askins, who I've mentioned a couple times, who at this point was a brain on a Roomba who was maintaining the vault in perpetuity. The reason for this was because it was his own pet project pre-war, and several Vault Tech employees were cryogenically frozen under his watch. They would periodically be unfrozen when a new overseer needed to be elected in one of the other two vaults. 
And the point of this was to make sure that the leader of the vaults was someone from Vault Tech who would uphold the values set by the company and Bud Askins, and would eventually go up to the surface to claim it under a monopoly. The residents of Vault 32 eventually found out the truth about Vault 31 and started a riot in which they were all killed by either infighting, suicide, or starvation. Later, the vault was overtaken by Lee Moldaver's raiders, who got into Vault 33 and killed many of the people there, instigating the events of the show. Currently, as far as we know, Vault 32 has been repopulated with members of Vault 33, and they are both still under the control of Bud Askins from the Shadows. Of course, there's a lot more nuance from that, but that's the entire plot of Season 1 of the show, so I'm not going to go over that right now. Vault 34 in the Mojave Desert was a social experiment in which the inhabitants were given access to an overstocked armory with no safety precautions or security measures in place. So, basically, it was a bunch of people who were isolated and given as many weapons as they could ever want. The Vault Dwellers decided to manually lock and restrict access to the armory, and gave access to the armory over to Vault Security. Eventually, there was a schism that led to the inhabitants of the Vault leaving and forming a gang known as the Boomers. In this scuffle, the reactor was damaged and radiation leaked into the Vault, ghoulifying or killing everyone inside over time. Jumping all the way up to Vault 51, which was in northwestern Virginia in the Appalachians, there was a social experiment in which an AI, Zax 1.3C, was appointed with selecting the ideal overseer from the inhabitants rather than them being selected through a democratic process. Zax ended up going a little overboard in their testing of the inhabitants and started to test them by putting them through various crises like hosting a talent show where their betting and personal possessions were put on the line. Eventually, the AI started just straight up threatening people with their lives. And through manipulating the inhabitants, it started encouraging the inhabitants to start killing each other off one by one. We know that Vault 62 existed, but it's been inaccessible up until this point in known history. Its home is in West Virginia, southwest of Lewisburg, but nothing is known about what happened or what is currently happening in this vault. Vault 75, which was in Maiden, Massachusetts, was both a social and medical experiment. Ooh, jolly days. Which had the purpose of using eugenics to breed young inhabitants into perfect soldiers. It was placed under a middle school, and the entire point was to convince children who attended the school that this vault was a safe place to go to in the event of nuclear war. When the bombs did drop, their parents took their children there, and they were immediately separated from their children, and the adults were executed by the security detail. The children were told horrors of the up-top land, which is what they called the wasteland, and that the only way they could survive the horrors up top was to get strong and become good soldiers. And then, by process of harvesting genes from prospective candidates, they created those soldiers. They left the vault at some unknown point, and with its doors open, the gang, the Gunners, made their way in to expand their hold on Maiden. Vault 76, north of Flatwoods, West Virginia, was a control vault. The vault doors were set to open 20 years after the bombs dropped, and its inhabitants were instrumental to recolonizing Appalachia. Plenty of the inhabitants were students or had graduated from vault Tech University, and it was their job to make sure that civilization happened as normal up on the surface after the bombs dropped. However, they didn't open as scheduled. The inhabitants got used to their cushy life in the vault and stayed there for several years past when they were supposed to. They eventually ended up opening 25 years after the bombs dropped in 2102, largely due to overpopulation, and then set out to recolonize Appalachia, which they did. Vault 77 is in an unknown location and was home to the lone man with many puppets. He was intentionally sealed into the vault alone, and as he was being sealed in, he pleaded that this had to be a mistake and to let other people into the vault with him, but he was shut in by his lonesome. He ended up finding a crate full of hand puppets and started to play with them, and over the course of a year and a half, quickly lost himself to playing games with them. After a while, he began to think that one of the puppets was actually talking to him, and he ended up tearing apart the king puppet in a fit, and tried to blame the king puppet's death on the vault boy puppet, who ended up reasoning with him that he was actually responsible. Horrified of what the dog puppet were to do if he found out what he had done, the puppet man and the vault boy ended up escaping the vault together, leaving it uninhabited. This has to be one of my favorite vaults because of how ridiculous it is, but it's also incredibly messed up when you think about it. Vault 79, north of the Dolly Sods Wilderness in West Virginia, was home to a secret service facility that was intended to house the United States gold reserves. However, in a seemingly common theme, the reactor leaked, ghoulifying or killing the agents who were assigned to the vault. 
The survivors were rescued by the residents of Vault 76 who were enacting a heist to steal the gold reserves. Vault 81 in Boston, Massachusetts was a research facility whose scientists would work on developing a universal cure for diseases. That sounds pretty altruistic, right? Wrong. They used unwilling test subjects to do their experiments on, and the overseer eventually kiboshed the operation because of a moral objection. The scientists were locked in a portion of the vault with no means to escape, and so they eventually died after trying to continue their experiments on mole rats. In Vault 87 in Northwest Virginia, there was another research facility that was dedicated to studying the effects of a forced evolutionary virus, or FEV, on humans with the surrounding population as test subjects. If you know about FEV, then you know where this is going. Long story short, FEV is what created super mutants. So the people who were in the vault ended up being turned into super mutants and eventually overpowered the researchers and took over the vault. Vault 88, which was in northwest Quincy, Massachusetts, was a testing facility for experimental productivity boosting equipment that was supposed to be used in other vaults. However, the vault's construction was never completed, and the overseer became a ghoul. Later, in Fallout 4, she recruits the sole survivor to help her carry out the experiments. Vault 92 was in Olney, Maryland, and was a medical facility that was testing the effects of white noise, and specifically trying to induce violent tendencies with it. The inhabitants, surprise surprise, went insane. They were driven to madness and, in an excessive rage, killed each other. I'm sure that this was the intended outcome, seeing as, you know, they were trying to induce aggression, but... I'm not exactly sure what this vault was trying to do. Vault 94 was also north of the Dolly Sods wilderness and was a social experiment testing the viability of pacifist belief systems in a post-apocalyptic world. All of the inhabitants were members of a non-violent religious group, with the exception of one devious vault tech employee. The vault dwellers were not given any means to protect themselves and were urged to open their vault doors to other survivors, who would likely be raiders and the point was to see how they reacted to that aggression. The employee eventually ended up confessing to the experiment and urged the inhabitants to find a way to arm themselves, which they ignored because of their religion and were subsequently massacred by outsiders. Vault 95, southwest of Natick, Massachusetts, was an experiment where addicts were given experimental treatments for rehabilitation and urged to stay clean of chems. Once again, that sounds like a good thing, right? Um, man, why can't we have nice things? The inhabitants went through a program for five years where they would stay clean. Then a vault tech employee who was masquerading as someone also going through rehab opened a secret stash of drugs to entice the other inhabitants who were informed of the stash and their reactions were documented. Unfortunately, after the stash was opened, the vault dwellers very quickly resorted to violence. While initially the test results had been positive and the hypothesis was that when an individual was sealed off from the outside world and cannot physically get the drugs that they're after, they can recover, that all went to the wayside once the drugs were reintroduced to the community. Some really tried to resist the temptation, but ultimately succumbed. Later, the vault was occupied by the gunners, and it's not known what happened to the original occupants. Vault 96, south of Spruce Knob Campground in West Virginia, was a research facility that was intended to monitor and study the local flora and fauna so that they could be preserved for their future. However, their actual goal ended up being to use genetic engineering to develop anti-mutant vaccines. The whole thing was run by the overseer, Eric DeMarcos, who basically made the others do his research under duress. And because of the unethical nature of the vault, if they failed to meet their quotas, there was an automatic security system in place that would kill them. Eventually, they decided that they didn't want to be there anymore and tried to sabotage the security systems and escape, but were unsuccessful and were killed in the process. But after they were killed, some of the test subjects were able to actually escape the facility. Vault 101, west of Springvale, Virginia, was an experiment in which the overseers were granted unlimited authority over a vault and it was intended to stay closed in perpetuity. Eventually, one of the overseers decided to secretly open the vault doors and send out scouting parties into the wasteland, where they recruited an outsider, James, as a doctor. James is father to the lone wanderer, the protagonist of Fallout 3, and when they both left the vault, it fell into a civil war and the residents splintered into different groups. Some wanted to remain isolated, and some wanted to go to the surface. Vault 106 was in northwestern Virginia, and was there for the purpose of seeing what happened when psychoactive drugs were released into the air via filtration systems. To no one's surprise, this ended in chaos. 
The overseer was sure that the experiment would be brief and non-lethal, but when the people started to suddenly hallucinate out of nowhere, they became extremely violent and overran the security personnel. The vault was basically destroyed in the process, and the drugs never stopped being filtered into the air, which meant that any survivors were constantly under its effects, and anyone who ended up entering the vault afterwards would be as well. Vault 108, north of Washington, D.C., Maryland, studied the effects of leadership conflicts. Most leadership positions were issued by a terminally ill overseer upon entry, which meant that he would die shortly after the vault was closed, which would provide a catalyst for conflict as they needed to elect a newer overseer suddenly. The power supply was also made to fail in 20 years or so, and the backup power was not enough to power the vault. There was also three times the amount of necessary weaponry in the vault, and it also lacked basic entertainment. So it, it was basically set to fail, and it would test how people would band together and solve these issues. Or apparently, it was to see how they would start cloning the same man, Gary, forever. See, they didn't have basic entertainment, but they did have an extensive cloning lab. A man named Gary had several clones of himself made, and the Garys became immediately hostile against non-Garys. I don't know why they decided to continue after they learned this fact, but they kept going, and after the 53rd Gary, the inhabitants started to wonder, why do we keep cloning Gary? We don't have a lot more room left in the observation rooms, and finally asked themselves what to do about the situation. Then came in Gary 54, who was a violent psychopath who started injuring people right off the bat. Eventually, the Gary clones overran the vault, and there was nothing left but Gary. And this one is also very much in contention for my favorite vault. Vault 111 in Sanctuary Hills, Massachusetts, as you might know, was studying the long-term effects of cryogenic stasis. The catch is, is that no one knew that they were going to be cryogenically frozen, but rather learned that once the bombs dropped and they were locked inside and so they had no choice but to hop into their pods and hope for the best. The all-clear signal was never given, and the inhabitants weren't woken up, resulting in the security detail and staff abandoning the vault. Eventually, some rapscallions from the Institute broke into the vault, stole a baby, killed its mother, and cut power to the vault, killing everyone inside except for the sole survivor, the protagonist of Fallout 4. Vault 112 was in Smith Casey's garage in Virginia, and yes, that's an automotive shop that it was under, and hosted a social experiment where the inhabitants were placed in virtual reality simulations that was controlled by the overseer. The overseer basically tortured the inhabitants in VR for centuries for his own sick amusement. He would force the inhabitants to kill each other in VR, and then resurrect them in the simulation with no recollection of what happened, and continued to use them as his playthings for as long as he lived. What was the point of this vault? I really don't know. Fun, I guess? Vault 114 was in Boston, Massachusetts, and was a social experiment in which only wealthy members were granted access to the vault. They would be stripped of their luxury and forced to live in squalor under an incompetent overseer who was specifically picked out by Vault Tech because he had zero qualifications. The overseer's legal name was not known because he only ever referred to himself as Soup Can Harry, who held the firm belief that the government was using tax dollars to pay for Illuminati Freemason sex parties, and loved eating a Braxo cleaner. That's the kind of man who they decided to put in charge of the vault. The purpose of this was to see how inhabitants reacted to having everything taken away from them, and to see how the stress of having old Soup Can Harry in charge of their lives affected them. Good old Soup Can Harry. And lastly, we have Vault 118, which was on Mount Desert Island in Maine. This was a social experiment in which 10 residents would live in luxury, while the other 300 would live in impoverished squalor. And if that wasn't bad enough, the 10 who got to live a life of luxury were also in charge of the rest of the inhabitants of the vault. Thankfully, the lower class section of the vault was never completed because the construction funds were embezzled, so this never really came to fruition. Instead, one of the main investors was funding the RoboBrain project, which is pretty self-explanatory. And the 10 lucky luxury members had their brains transferred into robots, and they lived their lives inside the vault. The only one who wasn't a robobrain was the overseer, who was the only person living in a vault full of violent robobrains. Eventually, there was a murder, as you would expect, which forced them to finally open their doors to seek a detective that would help them solve the case. And boy, oh boy, that's the end of that. I didn't expect that to go on for as long as it did, but here we are. 
There are a few other unfinished or unnumbered vaults, but there isn't a ton of detail surrounding them, so I don't really feel the need to even mention them. But maybe one day when we get the next Fallout game, I'll amend this list or make a new episode going over the new vaults, and we'll see what happens. So the moral of the story is that Vault Tech was not a very morally rich corporation. While you might think that the ones who were creating Fallout shelters to save people from the end of the world might have some invested interest in actually saving people, you would be very wrong in assuming that. As time went on, they got increasingly worse and worse, especially with the Vault experiments, and I'm glad that they ultimately ended up fading into obscurity. That is, until the return of the show. We'll see what Season 2 brings with the new information that Vault Tech might be the ones who dropped the bombs in the first place. I wanted to touch more on that topic, but I don't think that there's enough information to tell us whether or not that was actually true. From what I understand, it seems like the bombs were dropped earlier than anyone expected, and that even Vault Tech wasn't entirely prepared for it. So, maybe they didn't drop the bombs, maybe they did, I don't know. And so, what do you think? Do you think that there's any universe where Vault Tech could have not been the villains of the story? Or, how about the vaults? Do you have a favorite? After going over all of them, I think that Gary's Vault is my personal favorite, but the Puppet Man is a very close second. There are a lot of good ones, but both of those just tickle me pink. You can find us online at Lord to Death on your favorite social media apps, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have any questions or suggestions for topics, please send me a message wherever you can find me or at lordtodeath at gmail.com. If you're using the Spotify app, there is a Q&A function attached to the episode where you can submit any questions or topics. There's also a link in the show notes where you can send me a text. However, I cannot respond to this text, so whoever was just spamming it with, hello, who are you, I don't know. Either way, I would love to hear from you. And remember, if a salesman comes to your door asking you to buy a ticket for a fallout shelter, you might want to consider what's going to happen to you inside of that vault. Is it worth being subjected to a potential lifetime of torture, or would you rather just look into the glowing eyes of a nuclear bomb and hope for the best? I think I know which one I might choose. And I'll lure you to death in the next one. Oh, and I hid probably a dozen Easter eggs in this script, and no, I won't elaborate anymore. Good luck. See ya.